If you're looking for a cool SQL project to add to your data analyst portfolio, you've come to the right place. Hello and welcome to Learn BI Online with me, Adam Finer, helping you to do more with data and to build your data analyst portfolio with awesome projects like this one. In this video, you're going to learn how to design and build a SQL database, how to write custom SQL queries, and finally, how to connect your database to a BI tool to build some interactive dashboards. So it's a project that will demonstrate to any potential employers a load of different skills that you'll be required to have for working with SQL. Originally, this project was posted in three parts to separate out and teach these three different skills in shorter, more digestible videos. But I did a poll and asked whether you thought I should combine them into one longer video and you voted with a resounding yes. So here you go. I've put time codes to the three separate parts in the description so you can find them more easily. If you've got any questions or comments, just leave them in the comments section and I'll reply to every one of them if I can. Finally, before we get started, if you appreciate the content and would like to help out the channel in some way, you can either donate via the super thanks option below the video or you can purchase the project files to help you rebuild this project anywhere you choose via the link in the description. If you do, thank you very much indeed. Okay, without any further ado, let's get started. So we'll be using a real world scenario, but to keep the whole project more manageable, we'll be simplifying it a little so that these videos don't end up being hours long. Here is the scenario. The client, Ben, is opening up a new pizzeria in his town. It won't be a dine-in, just take-out and delivery, a bit like a Domino's. He's given us a project brief. The first part requires us to design and build a tailor-made bespoke relational database for his business that will allow him to capture and store all of the important information and data that the business generates. This will in turn help Ben to monitor business performance in dashboards that we'll build later on. We're just taking care of the back end. He's hiring someone else to build the front end ordering system. There are three main areas that the brief requires us to concentrate on – customer orders, stock levels and staff. We're going to start with customer orders. The way we're going to approach this task of designing our database and the tables in it is to spec out all of the fields for the data we want to collect. Then we'll go about the process of normalising the data, adding more related tables and defining the table relationships. Normalization is something very important in the relational database model, and I'll talk more about it in a minute. So, Ben has given us a list of the different data he'd like to collect for each order. Here it is. Item name, item price, quantity, customer name, and delivery address. Now, this list is only the starting point for us to spec out all of the fields we'll need for our orders table. We know that we're going to need to include things like an order ID field and split out the delivery address into different parts. And from looking at the menu Ben gave to us, we can see that there are different sizes of pizzas and beverages. So we could include this as a separate field. We could also include a field for the product category, so pizza, sides, desserts and beverages. Here's a mock-up in Excel of what the table could look like. We have our order ID and I've split out the delivery address into different address parts. Notice that I've also included a row ID. Why did I do this? Well, let's enter data for a first sample order. You notice that each order can contain multiple items. Therefore, we couldn't use it as a primary key to identify each individual row. Hence the row ID that will serve as our primary key. OK, so now we have an idea of the fields we need for our orders table. I'm going to show you a cool tool we can use to make our job of designing and building our database much easier. It's called Quick Database Diagrams, or Quick DBD, and I'll put a link to it in the description. Basically, you specify here on the left the tables and their fields, and on the right this produces a diagram of our database and its tables. I've gone ahead and created our orders table. 
So you can see you need to specify the field name followed by the data type. And for row ID, I've written PK after the data type to specify it as our primary key. Great, so now we can see what our orders table in its current state would look like. Let's go back to our first dummy order in Excel and take a look at the data. Can you tell me anything that jumps out at you? For me, it's the fact that we have a lot of repetition of data in the various rows. This is called redundancy, and the way we fix it is by what's called normalizing the data. So essentially, normalizing the data is the process of organizing it to reduce redundancy and make it more flexible and efficient. What we really want to do is to create new additional tables for both customers and delivery addresses, so that instead of using all these different fields in the orders data, we can just use an identifier instead. This will in turn make the database much more efficient. Let's start with customer names. In the orders table, we have two fields, first name and last name. To create a customer table, here on the left, I'm going to write the table name, customers, return, one dash, and another return. You'll see that a new table has been added to the diagram. In this customer table, I'm going to start by adding cust underscore ID with an int data type as a primary key. Then I'm going to cut the two customer field names from the orders table and paste them into our new customers table. That's great, but now we need to replace those two fields in the orders table with the customer ID field as an identifier, like so. Now all we need to do is to specify the relationship between these two tables. I do this by dragging from cust ID in one table to cust ID in the other. In our syntax on the left, we can see that cust ID has now been specified as a foreign key connected to orders.cust ID. Make sense? Let's do a similar operation for our delivery addresses. I'll create a new address table containing an address ID field. I'll cut the address fields from the orders table and paste them into the address table. And make sure to add the address ID field to the orders table in their place. There's one more thing we need to do to the address table, and that is to add a null constraint to the delivery underscore address to field. The reason for this is that by default, quick DBD applies the not null constraint to every single field, meaning that it cannot contain null values. However, the delivery underscore address to field is not always needed, so can in fact be null. Once that's done, I will then specify the relationship between the address and orders tables. Now, this is looking a lot better, but I'm also going to need to create a product or item table. This will serve two main purposes. First, it will reduce the amount of data in the table, like with the other two examples. And second, let's imagine that at some point, Ben might want to change the name of an item. If we have an item table containing a list of all menu items, we would only need to change one row of data in the table rather than changing all the rows in the orders table where the item existed. Much more efficient. Here in Excel, I have what the item table data looks like. We have item ID, SKU, item name, item category, item size, and item price. I'm going to go ahead and create this new item table and specify the relationship in quick DBD like so. Looking good. And that is the orders part taken care of. So for the stock control data, essentially what Ben would like to be able to do is to put in place a way for him to know when it's time to order new stock. To do this, we're going to need more information about what ingredients go into each pizza, their quantity based on the size of the pizza, and the existing stock level. If we really wanted to add more complications to the project, we could also factor in different lead times of different suppliers in delivering new stock, which would mean us needing to calculate exactly when to reorder each item or ingredient. But I think to keep things more simple, we'll just assume that the lead time for all items is the same. So Ben has kindly supplied us with the necessary information on each pizza ingredient and the weight that the item is sold in. 
He's also given us a list of the ingredients and the amounts that go into each pizza. I've turned all of this information into two separate tables that I'm going to create in Quick DBD. We can see from the data that the recipe ID is the same as the SKU from the item table. And the ingredient ID appears in both the ingredient and recipe tables. So those are the relationships that I've specified. With all of this data, Ben will be able to calculate exactly how much each pizza costs to make. If supplier prices go up, he'll just need to update the ingredient prices in the ingredients table. Finally, we'll need a table to hold stock levels for each ingredient. This inventory table will contain inventory ID, item ID, and quantity fields. And that's it for the stock control part. The final part is staff data. According to the brief, Ben would like to know two things. Which staff members are working when, then, based on their salary information, how much each pizza is actually costing him. Not only in terms of ingredients, but also the chefs making the pizza and the cost of delivery based on the time it took to deliver. Let's start with the staff table. Here it is in Excel. We have staff ID, staff first name, staff last name, position and hourly rate. Then we have a shift table. This contains shift ID, the day of the week, the start time and finish time. Most staff work both the lunchtime and evening shifts on any given day, but some do not, which is why we need to split them up. The final table we're going to need is the rotor table. This will tell us who is working when. For this, we'll need a row ID, a shift ID, the date and the staff ID. The relationships between the final three tables are shift ID from the shift table to shift ID in the rotor table, then staff ID from the staff table to staff ID in the rotor table, and finally date from the rotor table to created date in the orders table. This last one will give us the join we need between the staff tables and the order tables. Now we have everything we need for Ben's database, at least for this simplified scenario. Once we've designed the database, there's just the small matter of creating it to be done. Fortunately, this is where QuickDBD makes life very easy indeed. All I need to do is to go to the export menu, where I can choose to export the SQL code into a variety of different RDBMS syntax. I'm going to be using MySQL, so I'll select this option. If I open the downloaded file, you can see that it contains all the code needed to create the tables. So at this point, you might be thinking, but how do I get access to an instance of MySQL? Well, it's actually not that difficult. I'm not going to go into it in this video, maybe I will in another one, but just search on YouTube for how do I install MySQL on my computer? Once it's installed, you'll be able to create connections to it so that you can then create databases like I'll be doing now in Navicat. Link in the description. If I go into Navicat, I can right click on my MySQL connection and create a new database. I'll call it PizzaDB. For the character set, I'll choose UTF-8 MB4 and I'll set collation to UTF-8 MB4 underscore Unicode underscore CI. And here it is on the left. To create our tables in this database, I'll right click and select execute SQL file. Choose my SQL file and run. Hey presto, the tables have now been created in my database. I can now populate the tables where I already have the data. I've downloaded the ingredients Excel sheet as a CSV file, and now I can just use the Navicat import wizard. Select CSV, add the file, continue, 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 the target table is ingredient, check the fields are correct, and then either use the append or copy methods. Click start. No errors, great. We'll refresh the ingredient table and we can now see the data has been added. Simple. With all of our tables set up, we'll now be able to write the SQL queries necessary to create views of the database that will in turn allow us to build the dashboards Ben needs in the next video. We're going to start with the orders data, and here's a quick reminder of the tables we built. 
we have tables for menu items, orders, customers, and delivery addresses. If we look at the brief, we can see a list of the queries we'll need to build a view for. Total orders, total sales, total items sold, average order value, sales by category, top selling items, orders by hour, sales by hour, orders by address in a map, and orders by delivery method. Here in the orders table, we've got row ID, order ID, created at, item ID, quantity, customer ID, delivery method, and address ID. So we're going to need to join the item data and the address data to the orders data. Let's get started. Here in Navicat, I'm going to create a new query and start selecting the columns I need. Select Return. The first query is Total Orders. For this, we'll need the Order ID column so that we can count them. Now, because we'll be joining data from different tables in the database, to simplify the query syntax, I'm going to be using table aliases. So let's start with O for Orders, dot Order underscore ID. Next, the brief asks for the total sales, for which we'll need the item price column from the item table. So we can sum up all of the values. I for item dot item underscore price. For total items sold, we'll need the quantity column. O dot quantity. To get an average order value, we can simply divide total sales by total orders. That we can do in our BI tool, so no need for any calculations in our query here. Next up is sales by category, so we'll want to add i.item underscore cat. Number six, top selling items. For this, we'll need i.item underscore name. Numbers seven and eight, Orders and sales by hour are going to need o.created underscore at, which contains a timestamp. For nine orders by address, I'm going to add all of the address fields. So a.delivery underscore address one, a.delivery underscore address two, a.delivery underscore city, and a.delivery underscore zip code. And finally, for query 10, from the orders table, we'll need the o.delivery column. OK, so those are the columns we need. And now we just have to specify how to join these three tables, item and address, to orders. First up, we type from orders, followed by its alias, o, as the table will join the others too. Then we're using a left join to the item table, I on the joining condition o.itemid equals i.itemid. For those of you who are unfamiliar with SQL joins, I'll put a link in the description to another of my videos that breaks them down for you. But you can still carry on with this video and watch that one after if you like. Let's keep going. So we've joined the item table to orders, and now we'll do the same to the address table. I'm just going to copy and paste this row and change it to the address table on o.add underscore id equals a.add underscore id. And that's it. We run the query and we can see the result. It contains all of the columns we'll need for our first dashboard. OK, so the next part of the brief relates to inventory and stock levels. If we look at the client brief, we can see the requirements in terms of data. Total quantity by ingredient, total cost of ingredients, calculated cost of each pizza, and percentage stock remaining by ingredient. We're going to need to create two different views of the data in order to give us the result we'll need for all of the queries we have to include in the dashboard. You'll see why as we go through. In fact, this is something that you need to bear in mind when you're doing this kind of work. You ideally want to have as few views, i.e. different data sources, as possible to work with in your BI tool. But sometimes you'll actually be better off not trying to twist your data into knots to try and get the desired result, when you could actually create more than one view that will give you the same result and won't adversely affect the way you need to build your dashboards. The trick is to identify which approach to take, and this comes with practice. 
OK, so let's start off with working out how to produce a SQL result that will give us total quantity by ingredient. To calculate this, we'll need to know how many orders there were and what the recipe is for each pizza. We can then multiply one by the other to get the total quantity, or weight. First, what I'm going to do is to create order quantity per pizza. And for this, I'll need the orders table and the item table that contains all of the menu items and their names. Again, I'm going to use table aliases. So select o.itemid, i.sku, i.itemName. Then we'll need to aggregate the quantity column. So sum o.quantity in parentheses as order quantity from orders alias o. We'll then left join from the item table i on the joining key o.itemid equals i.itemid. Then we'll use the group by for our aggregation o.itemid i.sku i.itemName. If we run that, we get what we need, or at least the first step of what we need the number of orders per pizza. But now we'll need to break down these pizzas by ingredients. That comes from the recipe table. So we'll need to join to this next. Left join recipe r on i.sku equals r.recipe id. And the columns we want to include in the result are r.ing id and R dot quantity as recipe quantity. Because we've added these columns to the result, we'll also need to add them to the group by. When we run that, we can see the breakdown by ingredient ID as well now. But we're going to need the ingredient name, and that comes from the ingredient table, which means, you guessed it, we'll need to join that as well. Left join ingredient, ing, on ing dot ing id equals r dot ing id and we'll add the ing name column to the result and therefore the group by we're looking good so far we can now calculate the total quantity of ingredients using this result the next thing we need to do is to calculate the total cost of ingredients we already have the quantity, so if we can get a unit cost for each ingredient, we can then multiply this by the number of units, i.e. the quantity or weight. We've actually already got access to this data because it's in the ingredient table that we've already joined. We just now need to include the columns which are ing.ingWeight and ing.ingPrice. Let's not forget that we also need to add them to the group by. Now, at this point, one of the things I'm going to need to do is to multiply order quantity by recipe quantity. But the problem we have is that order quantity is already an aggregated field. This means I can't use it in the calculation we need in the same select statement. So how do we do it then? Well, the answer lies in what are called sub-queries. Let me show you how this works. I'm going to put this whole query in between parentheses. Before the open parenthesis, I'm going to type select star from. And after the closed parenthesis, I'm going to give this whole query an alias of S1. Now, if I run this query, I get exactly the same result as we had before. But now I can specify the columns I want from the S1 query and result and do anything to them as if they were in a regular table. Like, for instance, using them in calculations. Just what we're looking to do. This will also give us a chance to select just the columns we're interested in to make our result as tidy as possible. The other columns will remain available to specify at a later date if we so desire. I want s1.itemName, s1.ingID, s1.ingName, s1.ingWeight, s1.ingPrice, s1.orderQuantity, s1.RecipeQuantity. 
And then we want to calculate order quantity multiplied by recipe quantity as, I'm going to call this ordered weight. For cost per unit, it'll be the ing price divided by ing weight as unit cost. Finally, we want to calculate the unit cost multiplied by the ordered weight to get the ingredient cost. So we'll just copy and paste those two calculations here and call it ingredient cost. If we wanted to, we could actually remove the columns that we don't need, like ing weight and ing price, because we don't really need them. But they're not doing us any harm, so I'm just going to leave them in. This is great. We now have all we need to not only calculate cost of ingredients, but also the cost to make each pizza, which is point three in the brief. For the remaining two points, percentage stock remaining by ingredient and list of ingredients to reorder based on remaining stock levels, we're going to need to create another query to give us what we need. But it'll be based on the work we've already done. We're going to want to take the result we've just created with our custom SQL query and manipulate it some more. To make this job easier, I'm actually going to turn our custom SQL query into a new view. But I hear you saying, I thought what we've done so far was a view. Well, in fact, no. We've been writing what are called ad hoc custom queries. What's the difference? The short answer is not a lot, at least in terms of what our use case is and the data model we're working with. As far as I can gather, and I am no SQL expert, there is relatively little difference in terms of query performance, and they both work in almost identical ways. If you do really want to know what the difference is, please feel free to investigate for yourself, but that's as far as I'm going to go. In Navicat, I'm simply going to select all and copy the query. Then new view, paste and save as stock one. Going forward, if we want to work with the data in this view, I can just refer to it as stock one as I would a table, like you see here in this new query. Now I want to calculate A, the total weight ordered, B, the amount of inventory, and C, the amount remaining for each ingredient. The first step is to aggregate the ordered weight for each ingredient that we can do by selecting ing name and summing ordered weight as ordered weight. Of course, we need the group by with our aggregate function, so group by ing name. And there we have the start of our new desired result. What we need now is the total weight of inventory for each ingredient we started with. For this, I'm going to join the inventory table. And for this, we'll actually need to include the ing ID column because it'll be our joining key. I'm going to turn this query into a subquery like we did before and call it S2. Now let's left join the inventory table to it, like so. We can see in the result that now we have the quantity for each ingredient in stock. But we also need to add in the total weight in stock from the ingredients table. That will be the quantity times by the weight that each ingredient is bought in, like so. In fact, we can actually take out these two columns and just leave the calculation. Perfect. The last piece of this particular puzzle is to calculate total inventory weight minus the ordered weight as remaining weight. And we're done. That is everything we need for the stock part of the brief. So if you remember from part one, we have three separate tables for the staff part. Staff, rotor and shift. We want to start with the rotor table because this contains the date. So we'll select r.date because we'll give the rotor table an alias of r. Then I'd like the first and last names of the staff members. Using the alias s for staff, I'll specify s.firstname and s.lastname. I'm also going to need their hourly rate for our calculations, s.hourlyrate. 
Now we want to join the staff table to the rotor table. So left join staff on the joining key is r.staffid equals s.staffid. If I run that, we can see it gives us the result we need. Next up, I'd like to include data from the shift table as well, specifically the start and end times of each shift. So with an alias of sh, I'll type sh.starttime and sh.endtime. In order to join this data, I'm simply going to copy and paste the previous join we just made and modify it to be shift sh instead of s and r.shiftid equals sh.shiftid. Great, we're almost there. The final thing we'll need to do is to calculate the staff cost per row. This will essentially involve calculating the number of hours in each shift and multiplying this by the hourly rate. Sounds simple, but it's actually not as simple as that. At least the way I do it isn't that simple. If you're watching this and you know a better way, please do let me know in the comments below. I'm going to be using the time diff function, turning the result into a total number of minutes and then dividing this by 60 to get a number of hours as a decimal to then be multiplied by our hourly rate. Here it is, and I'm simply going to walk you through it. So the first part asks for the difference in hours between the start hour and the end hour, which is then multiplied by 60 to turn it into a number of minutes. Then I add to this the difference between the start and end minutes. This gives us a total minutes that I then divide by 60 to get the decimal hours. We can see in the result that this is giving us the correct calculation. In order to get the staff cost for each row, I just need to copy and paste this row and multiply it by s dot hourly rate. And voila! We'll now be able to sum up all of our staff costs and hours worked for any given period and break that down by staff member. In this third and final part of my Data Analyst Portfolio SQL project, we're going to be designing and building dashboards using data we collected in the database we designed in part one and then wrote custom SQL queries for in part two. Let's dive in. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the tools I'll be using and where the data is being queried from. For this exercise, I'll be using Google Data Studio as our BI tool. The reasons being that it's free to use so you can follow along and it has all of the functionalities we're going to need. The data we'll be visualizing is in a database inside of a Google Cloud MySQL instance. If you'd like to know how to create a similar instance, let me know in the comments and maybe I can make a video tutorial. But for this video, I'm just going to show you how to connect to the database using our BI tool. If you use a different BI tool and you'd like to reproduce this project, you can get your hands on a SQL dump file via the link in the description that will allow you to recreate the MySQL database anywhere you like. Okay, that's the housekeeping out of the way. Now let's connect to our database and build our first dashboard. To create our first data source in Data Studio, I'm going to click the Create button and select Data Source. Now I need to find and click the Cloud SQL for MySQL connector here. In order to connect to the database, we're going to need four pieces of information. First, the instance connection name that I can find in the Google Cloud back office. Then the name of the database we want to connect to, followed by a username and password that you can set up also in the Google Cloud back office. Once I authenticate, Data Studio will communicate with the database that will return a list of all the tables and views that are available. You can see here all of the different tables as well as the stock one view we created in the previous video. You'll also notice that we have the option to select custom query. This is what we're going to use. Here's the query that we wrote for the orders dashboard in the previous video. Again, if you'd like to get your hands on this and all of the other queries we'll be using today, just use the link in the description. I'm going to copy and paste here and hit connect. Now we're presented with the data source schema. 
i.e. all of the fields it contains. What we need to do now is to check that all of the fields have been attributed the correct data type. Created at is date and time, delivery is boolean, delivery address 1 has been assigned as text, which might be okay, but it would be better to specify it as geo address. Address 2 contains no data, so I'll just leave that. Delivery city is city and delivery zip code needs to be changed to geo postcode. Item category and item name are both text, that's fine. Item price, I'm going to choose currency USD. Order ID has been assigned date, not sure why. So let's make this text because it's qualitative. And finally, quantity is a number. Great. Let's name this data source orders data. I'm now going to hit create report and add our new data source. And we'll find ourselves in the report builder, ready to start building our first dashboard. Looking at the client brief for the orders dashboard, we can see that there are 10 data visualizations or queries that he would like to include. Total orders, total sales, total items, average order value, sales by category, top selling items, orders by hour, sales by hour, orders by address in a map, and orders by delivery and pickup. Starting with total orders, we're going to want a scorecard visualization because it only displays one single KPI figure. Unless you're comparing date periods, then you'll have a figure for the difference between the two figures. Anyway, we're just going to show total orders. The calculation for this will be a distinct count of order IDs. For those of you unfamiliar, a distinct count returns the number of different values in a column whereas a simple count will return the number of rows containing any value, or to put it another way, the number of non-blank rows. If we count the number of distinct order IDs, this will give us the number of orders. I'm just going to delete this table that Data Studio added and then add a scorecard. By default, we've got record count, which is the count of the number of rows in the dataset which I'll replace with order ID. You can see here it says CTD, which stands for count distinct. It's the aggregator used for the query, and it's what we're looking for. We have a total of 58 orders. We're going to want to change the name of the KPI that's displayed by clicking on the pencil icon. Total orders. Great, we now have our first visualization. Next up is total sales, i.e. the amount of money these 58 orders generated. To calculate this, we're going to need to create a new calculated field that will multiply the item price by the quantity. I'll hit add a field, call this total sales, and write the formula item price multiplied by quantity. Save and finished. I'll now add another scorecard and use our new calculated field. There we go. All that's left to do is to turn it from a simple number into US dollars and in the style tab I'm going to choose compact numbers. Number three on our brief is total items, so this will yet again be another scorecard. What I'm going to do here is simply copy and paste this second scorecard using my keyboard shortcuts and add the quantity metric to the query. We'll also want to rename it to total items. You may at this point be wondering why I'm not talking about the design aspect of the dashboard. Well, that's because at this stage, all I'm interested in is creating the 10 visualizations asked for in the brief. Once I have all of these on the dashboard, I can then start to think about things like widget size, placement, colors, etc. Basically, we'll be building the dashboard in two phases, queries and then design. Point four is average order value. To get this figure, we'll need to divide total sales by total orders. So another calculated field. I'll call it average order value and type in the formula. 
sum total sales divided by count distinct order ID. You might be wondering here why I'm using the sum aggregator for this formula, whereas I didn't for the other one. The answer is that the total sales figure needed to be calculated on a row by row basis. Whereas here we want the sum of total sales divided by the distinct count of order ID. Again, I'm going to copy and paste this other scorecard and replace the metric with average order value. We're also going to change this from a number to USD. You might be thinking that this figure is quite high and you'd be right. That's what happens when you allow people free reign to order anything they like from a fictional pizzeria. Normally I would have removed the unrealistic orders from the dataset, but as there weren't that many to begin with, I decided to leave them in there. If you decide to get a copy of this data, you can obviously modify the values any way you wish. You could also add more orders if you like. OK, the next point, point 0.5 of the brief, asks for sales by category. So we'll need the total sales metric broken down by item category. For this, I could use a column or bar chart, but I'm going to use a donuts chart because there are just four values and I think it's best suited to the query. A donut chart is simply a pie chart with a hole in the middle. Let me add one to the dashboard. Now let's add total sales as our metric and item category as our dimension. Looking good. You might now be saying, but if you use a pie chart, it'll look more like a pizza. That'd be really cool. But no, the purpose of the dashboard isn't to look cool. It's to display as effectively as possible the data within it. There's also the ink to data ratio to consider and a donut chart uses less ink to display the same information and gives the data more space to breathe. For more information about the ink to data ratio and other dashboard design tips, check out the link in the description. Point six is top selling items. For this, I'm going to use a bar chart. The reason being that it shows the values vertically, which evokes hierarchy better than a column chart does. I could use a simple table, which would also show the values vertically, but the length of the bars will also allow us to easily see how the values compare. You might suggest using color encoding for the values of a table, but still not as effective as a bar chart. So with total sales as our metric and item name as our dimension, I'm just going to drag the Y axis to the right to increase the area available for the item labels. Great. Points seven and eight are orders by hour and sales by hour. I'm going to put these together into a line chart. You might be thinking that a time series chart would be better if we're using a date time field, but I'll show you what happens when we do. I'll first change the date time level to hour and you can see that we only have data for the opening hours of the restaurant, meaning the rest is blank. And with a time series chart in Data Studio, all values of the date or time level used must appear in the chart. You have options in the style tab for what to do with missing values, but neither line to zero, line breaks or linear interpolation are what we need. Nope, just going to have to use a line chart instead, which also means we'll need to change the sort method to our descending. Next, I'll add in order ID for total orders. Ah, that's no good. Because the scales used by the two different metrics are vastly different, we'll need to go into the style options and put total orders onto a right Y axis. And finally, let's change the name of the metric to total orders. And that is point seven and eight taken care of. Point nine is orders by address in a map. So let's add one to the dashboard. We're going to use a Google Maps bubble map. We can see that Data Studio has added Delivery City, but looking at the map, we can see that we've got one bubble on the east coast of the US and another in the UK. The reason for this is that the delivery city for some orders is Manchester. Our pizzeria is in the United States, so we need to somehow add in the country to the query as well as the full delivery address to be able to plot all of the bubbles. 
but there's only one field allowed for plotting the location. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we're just going to have to create a new field that concatenates the different address fields and adds United States at the end. Let's do this now. We'll call it full address and use the concat function. Inside the parentheses, we'll type delivery address one, comma, comma, space in quotes, comma, delivery city, comma, comma, space in quotes, comma, delivery zip code, comma, comma, space in quotes, comma, United States in quotes. Save and finished. Then we'll replace the current dimension with our new full address one. That's better. Now we'll zoom in to see the different bubbles. You might notice one or two bubbles plotted far from the Manchester cluster. That's because I generated these random addresses using a random address generator online. If we're dealing with a much larger data set, or if it was a real world data set, I would investigate a problem like this further and clean the data. But all I'm going to do here is to zoom in to see Manchester only. One last thing I'm going to do is to add total sales to the size metric, and we're done. The final query the brief asks for is to show orders by delivery and pickup. We can create this by adding the delivery dimension to a pie chart, and then use the distinct count of order ID as the metric, like so. And we're done. We have now added all of the 10 required visualizations to our orders dashboard. So here we are back in Data Studio, and here is part two, the inventory part of the dashboard brief. We have total quantity by ingredient, total cost of ingredients, calculated cost of pizza, percentage stock remaining by ingredient, and list of ingredients to reorder based on remaining inventory. I've already gone ahead and created the two stock data sources using the custom SQL queries we wrote in part two. The first thing I'm going to do is to add a new page to the report from here. Then on the right, I'm going to name the first page orders and this new page inventory. So the first two points both include ingredients. And because we have over 40 ingredients and products that we need to report on, I'm already thinking that the best way to visualize this data is using a simple table. Let's add one to the page by dragging ingredient name from the field list. Now we just need to add our metrics. First is total quantity, which is our ordered weight metric and then total cost, which is our ingredient cost metric. Let's sort by ordered weight. I'm going to rename the fields as total quantity and total cost. And then add a summary row to give us our column totals but it doesn't make much sense for the quantity column because the unit of measurement is different for different products and categories. So what I'm going to do instead is to add a scorecard showing just the total ingredient cost figure. Then we can uncheck the summary row. Next up, we've got calculated cost of pizza. And for this, we're going to need to add a new field that multiplies the recipe quantity by the unit cost. Let's go ahead and do this. Again, we're going to do the calculation row by row, so we don't want to include the aggregators. Now, let me drag item name from the field list and add in our new cost of pizza metric. Great. But what I also want to do is to filter the table on just the pizzas. And to do this, I'm simply going to add a filter from here call it pizza only, and include from item name contains pizza. And it's done. We can also change the data type to currency USD and sort on cost of pizza. We can see that the seafood pizzas cost the most to make. For the final two points of the stock brief, we're going to use the second data source we wrote a custom query for in part two. 
percentage stock remaining by ingredient, and a list of ingredients to reorder based on remaining inventory. If we think about it, both of these are pretty much asking for the same thing, and are going to be referencing the same data, i.e. the amount of inventory remaining will also show us which ingredients need to be reordered based on this figure. All we would need to do is to use conditional formatting to highlight ingredients and products in the table based on the percent remaining. Sounds good? Let's do it. I'm going to start by adding a table from the correct data source by dragging ingredient name and then adding the metrics total inventory weight and ordered weight. So the percent remaining will simply be the difference between these two divided by the total inventory weight. Let's add this field now. Percent remaining as total inventory weight minus ordered weight in parentheses divided by total inventory weight. Then I'll add this to the table. I'll need to change the data type to percent. And I don't need the two original metrics, so I'll remove them from the table. This is all looking good so far in terms of the fact that we've got everything we've been asked to include in the dashboard. But I'm not happy with it, and I think we can make it much better by combining these two ingredient tables into one. You might think that this would be complicated due to them coming from two different data sources, but it's actually really simple, and we can use one of Data Studio's more advanced features. I'll just select the two tables, right-click, and hit Blend Data. This will create a third table that contains the data from both tables. And now I can just delete the two original tables. Much better. It makes our dashboard much more efficient and easier to understand. The final piece of the puzzle is to use conditional formatting to show which products and ingredients need to be reordered straight away and which will need reordering soon. In the Style tab under Conditional Formatting, I'll add a new condition, which will be if the percent remaining is equal to or less than 0.25 or 25%, then we'll color the entire row with a red color. Save and add another. Now, if the percent remaining is greater than 0.25 and equal to or less than 0.5 or 50%, then we'll color the entire row yellow. Now we just need to change the sorting method to ascending and we can easily see which products need reordering. I like it. Just going to jump in here quickly to say that I hope you're finding this video useful. If you are, please do give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications if you haven't already so you don't miss an upload. And remember, if you'd like to get a copy of the data we're using for this project, as well as the MySQL dump file for you to be able to recreate the database wherever you like, please check out the link in the description. This third and final dashboard is going to be the easiest by far to build, as we'll only need two scorecards and a simple table with no calculations necessary. I've already gone ahead and added a new page and called it Staff. The first issue that we're going to need to address is the fact that the Staff data source contains data for multiple dates, but the Orders data contains only data for a single date. So we're going to need to apply a date filter to this whole page, so that we're just looking at the data for the same date as the orders. We will, however, add a date range control that will allow dashboard viewers to look at other dates if or when more data is added. First, we'll change the current page settings by right-clicking the page and selecting the relevant option. Data source will choose staff data, date range dimension is date, and we'll set a custom date range of the 10th of August, the date we have in the orders data. Next up, I'll add a date range control from here to the top right of the page. We can see that the date range is set to 10th of August. If we look at the client brief, we can see we have just four points. Total staff cost, total hours worked, hours worked by staff member, and cost per staff member. 
starting with total staff cost. This is going to be a single figure, so we'll use a scorecard visualization. I'll add one here and replace record count with the staff cost metric. Then we'll rename our metric as total staff cost. For total hours worked, I'll simply copy and paste this first scorecard and replace the metric with hours in shift. Then rename the metric to total hours worked. Perfect. The final two points, hours worked by staff member and cost per staff member, can be put into a table. In fact, what I'm going to do is just recreate the data source table by adding all of the metrics and dimensions. So I'll add a chart and in dimensions, we'll have first name, last name, start time and end time. And in metrics, we'll have hours in shift, hourly rate and staff cost. Great. If I double click any of the column lines, the columns will resize to fit. There we go. That's our staff dashboard done in terms of queries. You might be thinking that I should increase the size of the widgets so there's less blank space on the page, but really there's no need. The data is easy to read as it is, and as reporting requirements evolve, there may be more queries added to it. It's fine as it is. So now we've created all of the queries asked for in the client brief. The next step is to add design elements, colors, etc. Let's go to theme and layout. In terms of branding, what we have is the restaurant menu. There are loads of pre-built themes we could use, but if we go right to the bottom, we can also use an image for creating a new theme. I'll just hit extract theme from image and select the menu file. I think we'll choose this middle one. Looks good. There are a couple of other elements I'd like to add to all pages. The first is a rectangle at the top of the page. I'll first draw it and then right click and select make report level. Now when we load the other pages, we'll see the same rectangle. Here on page three, I'm also going to make the date range control report level as well. Back on the orders page, I'm going to add a page title. Orders. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is to resize and reorganize the widgets on the page. Like so. This widget here needs more information to tell viewers what they're looking at, so I'm going to add text here. Delivery question mark. I think this is looking good, but there's something else I'm going to do to make it even better, and that's to make the grid lines lighter. First, for this table, by going to Style and Cell Border Color, we'll choose a light gray. It's actually best practice to completely remove lines from charts like this, as it increases the ink to data ratio and potentially distracts attention from the data itself. But rather than doing that, I'm just going to make them much lighter. So you can still make them out, but they're not distracting. When it comes to these scorecards, most people would add a border to them and even a drop shadow, but normally I don't. For the same reason I just mentioned a moment ago, it's just additional ink that doesn't really add to the legibility of the data. They're not really close together to begin with, so I don't see any reason for borders to demarcate them. OK, let's move on to the inventory dashboard. We're going to need a title on this dashboard as well, so I'm going to go back to page 1, copy the orders text box and then paste it onto page 2. And we'll change the text to inventory. Again here, I'm going to select the two tables and in the style tab, I'm going to change the cell border color to a light gray. Finally, on page three, I'll paste the text box again and change it to staff and then change the cell border color. 
The very last thing I'm going to do is to check to see if I need to add any more titles or text to the dashboards to make them easier to understand. A lot of dashboards I see add a title to every single visualization to tell the viewer what they're looking at, but this is often unnecessary. The reason being that a lot of the time it's very easy to understand what data you're looking at without the need for a title. Sometimes all you need to do is to add an axis title rather than a chart title, like this line chart here. The legend tells us that we're looking at two lines for total sales and total orders. The only confusing thing is what the x-axis represents. So rather than adding a chart title, I'm just going to add the x-axis title from the style tab. For our bar chart, the legend tells us which metric we're looking at, as does our map. In fact, the only other piece of information necessary is the metric used in the donut chart. So I'm just going to add a small text box and type total sales. A quick glance at the other two dashboards tells us that no additional text or information is needed. So that folks is all. We have finished building and designing our three dashboards. If you'd like to rebuild this project anywhere you like, just hit the link in the description to get your hands on all of the project files. I really hope you enjoyed watching this project as much as I enjoyed making it. If you've got any ideas for other projects, let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you soon for another video. Until then, stay BI Curious.